Well, um, welcome, Chief Justice, Your Honours, other distinguished guests and audience members uh, to this, the 24th annual WA Lee Equity Lecture 2023, hosted by the Queensland Community Foundation and UQ Law School. I acknowledge and thanks, thank the Honourable Margaret McMurdo AC as Chair of the Queensland Community Foundation for the opportunity to partner with the uh, for law school to partner with the foundation uh, to present this event. For those of you wondering who I am, you may remember me from such events as the 23rd annual WA Lee Lecture 2022 and the 22nd annual WA Lee Lecture 2021. My name is uh, Rick Bigwood. I'm the Dean of the TCB, uh, uh, TC Burn uh, School of Law at the University of, of Queensland, so um, thank you for coming. Let me also begin by acknowledging on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Queensland Community Foundation, the traditional owners of the, and the custodianship of the land upon which we meet this evening. These are the people of the Yarragut and Turrbal nations of Mianjin, which we now call Brisbane. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend the same respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are present here this evening. I acknowledge the contemporary Queensland First Nations community who continue to maintain their identity, culture and Indigenous rights. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Now, the WA Lee Equity Lecture is held each year in honour of the for of foremost equity and trust academic and author, Honorary Professor WA Tony Lee. Uh, this prestigious series of lectures continues a long tradition of maintaining contemporary debate on matters of equitable jurisprudence, technique, principle and doctrine in Australia and beyond. Tonight's lecture is titled The Interaction of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Customary Law with Some Aspects of, uh, of the Law of Equity. Is the view any different through the lens of the Human Rights Act? And I'm delighted uh, that the lecture will be presented by the Honourable Chief Justice Helen Boskell. Chief Justice Helen Boskell is a graduate of the Queensland University of Technology, earning a Bachelor of Laws with Honours in 1995 and receiving the University Medal for that year. The following year, in 1996, Chief Justice Boskell was associate to the Honourable Justice Douglas Drummond of the Federal Court of Australia and in 1998, her honour was admitted as a barrister of the Supreme Court of Queensland. She was appointed Queen's Counsel in 2013. As a barrister, her honour practised widely in the areas of public, administrative and commercial law, with a particular focus on native title law. Between 2011 and 2014, Chief Justice Boswell served as counsellor on the Incorporated Council of Law Reporting of the State of Queensland. Her honour was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Queensland on 19 March 2022, having previously served as a judge of the Supreme Court of Queensland from 2017 to 2022. Before that, from 2014 to 2017, Chief Justice Boskell served as a judge of the District Court of Queensland, the Children's Court of Queensland and the Planning and, Environmental, uh, Planning and Environment Court of Queensland. Please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Helen Boskell to the podium to deliver the 24th WA Lee Equity Lecture for 2023. Good evening, everyone. Um, just before we start, because we've had a little bit of a delay and a few hiccups, I just need to multitask and pretend to be my associate and turn on the PowerPoint um, because she's had to run off and do something. So we might open the doors in case there's more people coming through. I'll sort that out and then we'll make a start. So, uh, good evening everyone, friends uh, and colleagues, members of the legal and the broader community. I acknowledge all of you as distinguished guests and as most welcome visitors to the Banco Court this evening. I also acknowledge the first owners and custodians of this land, the Turbal and the Yagara peoples, and of the land and waters across Australia. I pay my respects to their ancestors and their elders and thank them for their wisdom and leadership. 
It is a great honour to have been asked to give the WA Lee Equity Lecture this year. Can I just check that everyone can hear me sufficiently? That's good. Uh, unlike many of the previous speakers, I was not a student of Pro Professor Lee's, although I have admired his scholarship from afar and I have been the great beneficiary of his industry in the form of his seminal academic works, including, of course, Ford and Lee's Principles of the Law of Trusts and Lee's Manual of Succession Law. So I cannot begin the lecture tonight, um, for example, as the former Chief Justice de Jersey did in 2010, with a story about what Tony did at the start of his lecture on the day of the moon landing in July 1969. Nor can I share with you, as my colleague Justice Applegarth did in 2020, a witty anecdote about those Halcyon University days, complete with an adaptation of an ABBA song about Tony Lee's equity lectures, although of course I wish I could. But what a remarkable legacy this lecture series is, reflecting contemporary and thought-provoking discussions of matters of equitable jurisdiction and principle across the 23 years since the first lecture was given by Professor Lee himself. I'm very sorry that Professor Lee was not able to be here this evening. He was very keen to do so, but has sent a regretful apology as his health is such that it just was not possible. Although now 93, Tony Lee has not stopped thinking about equity and trust issues, nor lost the ability to express those thoughts with enviable clarity. He has been generous enough to share his latest thoughts with all of us in the form of a three minute tutorial. It is entirely apt that we start this evening by reference to W.A. Lee's trustees duties in 12 words. So this is Trustees Duties in 12 Words by W.A. Lee. A trustee's duty is to achieve unequivocally the purpose of the set law. As far as I know, trustees duties have never before been expressed in this way. Judges rarely refer to trustees general duties. Their task is to determine which of the parties before them in court should succeed, the losing party paying costs. To express a personal opinion might indicate bias or even a departure from normally accepted law. A judge who does refer to trustees duties probably uses words that have been used from the middle of the 19th century, such as that a trustee must observe strictly the terms of the trust. This is unsatisfactory. Trusts can exist without having terms, such as a bequest in a will and oral trusts. Words used may be vague or ambiguous, leaving the litigants unsure of what they may or must do or must not do, and even forego to appeal. As an example, suppose a testator leaves suitable provision for my handicapped daughter Susan. Many years later, the testator dies, but Susan has predeceased the testator, leaving a posthumous child, no name. The words of the will can hardly be seen as making suitable provision for the unborn child, although a TFM application may be possible, but if the will defines trustees' duty, duties in the manner suggested, the trustees should have no difficulty in making suitable provision for the unborn child. And now onto the lecture, which I hope you will not mind is somewhat more than 12 words. With some encourage, encouragement from John de Groot, I am perhaps adapting the theme slightly in what I have planned to say tonight. But I hope that you will ultimately find that I have not strayed too far from some of the fundamental equitable principles. For example, the notion of equity as enabling equality of enjoyment of rights, the emphasis on substance rather than form, the role of conscience and the need for the law to adapt in order to be apt to address the many and varied circumstances in which it is called upon to act. And I like to think that Professor Lee, the law reformer, would approve of the provocation of thought that is intended by my address to you. <clears throat> On any view, the history of First Nations Australians' occupation of this continent dates back many tens of thousands of years, with current research suggesting the temporal reach is upwards of 60,000 years. The diverse groups of people who occupied the lands and waters across Australia prior to first European contact, 
uh, both Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islander peoples, did so according to a subtle and elaborate system of laws, particular to distinct groups, which provided a stable order of society by governing rights, obligations and relationships between people and in relation to land and waters. Spiritual and cultural beliefs were and are central to the existence and regulation of these rights and obligations. As we know, the truth of that history was obscured for a long time. Ownership of this continent was claimed by the English crown in the 18th century by fastening onto what had become an enlarged concept of terra nullius, meaning a territory belonging to no one. Although originally the concept meant exactly that, it became enlarged in the sense that a territory did not necessarily need to be a complete desert uninhabited country to justify acquisition. Acquisition could be justified by reference to the then perceived benefits to those inhabitants of Christianity or European civilization and the concomitant discriminatory denigration of indigenous inhabitants, their social organization and customs. The reception here of the common law of England as the law of the land, albeit adapted as necessary, likewise depended upon the fallacy that the first peoples of this country had no laws and no social organisation prior to the arrival of English colonists. Nothing could be further from the truth. In 1992, the truth of our shared history was recognised and acknowledged by the High Court in the Mabo decision. The unjust and discriminatory expanded doctrine of ter terra nullius was rejected as a fiction that was both incorrect and no longer acceptable in terms of the expectations of the international community and the contemporary values of the Australian people. It was acknowledged that by acquiring sovereignty over the land, the Crown had acquired what might be called the radical title to the land, but that acquisition of sovereignty did not itself confer absolute beneficial title to previously occupied land. The rights and interests in relation to land which were held by the original uh, inhabitants survived the Crown's acquisition of sovereignty, although they were susceptible to extinguishment by subsequent valid exercise of the sovereign power. The customary laws acknowledged and observed by those original inhabitants also survived the acquisition of sovereignty, not as a separate legal system, but as a base uh, that could operate in opposition to or alongside the Australian legal system, but as a basis for the foundation of rights capable of recognition within the Australian legal system, with native title being a clear example of that. One year later, the Native Title Act 1993 was enacted by the Commonwealth Parliament in response to the Mabo decision. And almost 30 years later, the Human Rights Act 2019 was enacted by the Queensland Parliament. Amongst the human rights protected and promoted by this Act are the cultural rights of Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islander peoples, a concept that is much broader than the rights and interests that may be held in relation to land or waters. In that regard, Section 28 of the Human Rights Act um, provides by subsection 1 that Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islander peoples hold distinct cultural rights and by subsection 2 that Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islander peoples must not be denied the right with other members of their community uh, to enjoy, maintain, control, prote protect and develop their identity and cultural heritage including their traditional knowledge, distinctive spiritual practices, observances, beliefs and teachings and in subsection C to enjoy, maintain, control, protect and develop their kinship ties. One of the main objects of the Human Rights Act is to protect and pr promote uh, human rights. And section four contemplates that the, option, the objects of the Act will be primarily achieved in a number of ways, including by requiring courts and tribunals to interpret statutory provisions to the extent possible that is consistent with their purpose in a way compatible with human rights. Giving effect to that is section 48, dealing with interpretation. Section 48 is an instruction that all statutory provisions must, 
to the extent possible that is consistent with their purpose, be interpreted in a way that is compatible with human rights. <clears throat> The question of the interaction of customary laws of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people with the received English law of the land had already arisen in some cases prior to the enactment of the Human Rights Act. As it happens, and as I will shortly explain, explain uh, that was in the context of cases involving the application of equitable principles. That is an interesting inquiry in and of itself. But the further question I pose for the purposes of this lecture is whether the outcome in some of those cases may have been different if they had been decided after the commencement of the Human Rights Act. The first area I'll discuss is deceased estates. <clears throat> in the Queensland case of Eats and Gundy, the court was concerned with whether a relationship between the deceased and the person recognised as her child as a matter of, of a particular Aboriginal law and custom could fall within the relevant provisions of the Succession Act dealing with intestacy or family provision. Bradley Gundy was the biological son of Roslyn Eats, but he was raised from the time he was a baby by Roslyn's sister, Doreen. He called Doreen mum and she treated him as her son. The family were members of the Mayawali Karawali people. There was evidence before the court that an arrangement had been made between the sisters that Bradley would be brought up by Doreen as her son, and that that relationship was a permanent relationship which amounted to a mother and son relationship according to the laws and customs of the Mayawali Karawali people. However, no legal adoption in the sense of an act under the legislation had ever taken place. Doreen Eats died without leaving a will. Letters of administration were issued to her mother, Jocelyn Eats. Bradley commenced proceedings in the Supreme Court seeking, among other things, a declaration that under Section 10 of the Status of Children Act, he was a child of Doreen Eats and that she was his parent under Aboriginal tradition within the meaning of the Child Protection Act. Uh, and also for the purposes of Parts 3, Intestacy, and 4, Family Provision of the Succession Act. The administrator applied to strike out Bradley's claim on the basis that he had no interest on intestacy and also did not fall within the ambit of persons entitled to make an application for further provision from the estate. It was that strikeout application which led to the reported decisions in this matter. At first instance, Justice Atkinson concluded that the application to strike out should be dismissed because the evidence was such that Bradley may well be able to prove that he was the child of Doreen according to Aboriginal tradition and so have a claim under the family provision jurisdiction. Her Honour noted that that outcome was perhaps not surprising since one of the fundamental legislative principles set out in section 4 of the Legislative Standards Act 1992 required legislation to have sufficient regard to the rights and liberties of individuals and the same legislation further provided that that might depend on whether, for example, the legislation has sufficient regard to Aboriginal tradition and island custom. The administrator successfully appealed that decision with the result that Bradley's claim was summarily dismissed. The Court of Appeal held that even if Bradley could establish that he was in a parent-child relationship with Doreen, according to Aboriginal tradition, quote, his claims must fail upon the correct construction of the statutory provisions. For the purposes of the intestacy provisions, Bradley's claim could only succeed if he was Doreen's surviving issue and child within the meaning of the legislation. There is no definition of issue in the Succession Act, but it was held by the Court of Appeal that in the context of succession, the ordinary and prima facie meaning of issue is all descendants or progeny. And that is a broader category than child or children. It includes descendants of any degree. There is no generally applicable definition of child in the Succession Act either. The Court of Appeal in Eats and Gundy referred to and relied upon earlier authority for the proposition that in the context of the intestacy provisions, the meaning of child focuses upon a biological connection or blood relationship. 
This was contrasted with the definition of child for the purposes of part four of the Act, dealing with family provision, which extends to any child, stepchild or adopted child of the deceased person. But even in that context, Bradley could not bring himself within the provisions because he was not the biological child of Doreen and adopted child had a narrow definition, referring to adoption in accordance with the law, meaning the statute law. In support for the meaning of child uh, as focusing upon a biological connection, the Court of Appeal cited a 1915 High Court case of Seidel and, the, and Queensland trustees. But Justice Fraser in the decision also referred to some established extensions of the words child and issue. For example, to include a person who, although not the natural child of the husband, was born during the subsistence of the marriage. The case cited as an example of that extension is a Canadian decision, Reed Clark Trust from 1946. In that uh, decision, uh, Justice Dysart observed that in law, every child born of a couple during their marriage is lawful issue of the couple, even though the husband is not in fact the child's natural father. His Honour said, this rule of law is based not upon truth or fact, but upon public policy, which seeks to uphold the purity of the marriage relationship and to protect children born in wedlock. So that is an example where the meaning of child was extended or altered on the basis of public policy or perhaps societal expectations. And that principle is now reflected in statute law in section 24 of the Status of Children Act. But interestingly, it did not need to be expressed in a statute in order to be recognised as a matter of law. Of course, and as also noted in Eats and Gundy, in the case of a child who has been adopted under statute law, the effect of sections 214 and 216 of the Adoption Act is that an adopted child is treated as the issue of the deceased for the purposes of the intestacy rules. Similar statutory extensions of the meaning of child for the purposes of dispositions of property by will or on intestacy have also been made in relation to a child born through a surrogacy arrangement where a parentage order has been made um, and similar parentage presumptions are provided for uh, in the Status of Children Act in relation to a child born as a result of uh, IVF. And interestingly, I think I might have missed a slide. I did. So I'll move on from that one. Interestingly, the framework from the Adoption Act and the Surrogacy Act has recently been replicated, at least in the case of Torres Strait Islander traditional adoptions, in the Mariba Omaska Kazu Kazipa Torres Strait Islander Traditional Child Rearing Practice Act 2020. That act makes provision for the making of a cultural recognition order that has the effect of transferring a person's parentage from their birth parents to their cultural parents. As defined in that act, a cultural parent is a person who, in accordance with island custom, child rearing practice, agrees to accept the permanent transfer of the parental rights and responsibility for a child from their birth parents. In contrast, section seven, subsection one, little a of the Adoption Act provides that the Adoption Act is to be administered under principles which include, uh, quote, because adoption, as provided for in this Act, is not part of Aboriginal tradition or island custom, adoption of an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander child should be considered as a way of meeting the child's need for long-term stable care only if there is no better available option. It is not apparent from my research where the generalised generalized statement that appears in Section 71A of the Adoption Act came from. It is no doubt correct, read literally, that is, adoption as provided for in the Adoption Act is not part of Aboriginal tradition or island custom. But as has now been recognised by the legislature, an equivalent form of permanent change in parentage is part of Torres Strait Islander custom. It is also, as far as I am aware, part of the custom acknowledged and observed by some groups of Aboriginal people. And that is apparent 
from the native title determinations that have been made which record the laws and customs. And I give some examples uh, in the written paper. On the present state of the law, a person adopted in accordance with traditional law and custom other than island custom recognised by the 2020 Queensland Act is in a difficult and potentially disadvantaged position for the purposes of the intestacy rules or any family provision application. The Court of Appeal in Eats and Gundy disagreed with the primary judge's reliance upon the Legislative Standards Act as supporting a broader construction of the meaning of the words issue and child, holding that that act was in intended to operate prospectively and so could have no bearing upon the construction of the Succession Act, which was a prior act. The same cannot be said for the Human Rights Act. With only limited exceptions, the Human Rights Act applies to all acts and statutory instruments, whether passed or made before or after the commencement of the Act on the 1st of January 2020. Consequently, the Act could have a bearing on the construction of the words issue and child, and the words could be required to the extent possible that is consistent with their purpose to be interpreted in a way that is compatible with human rights, including cultural rights of Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islander peoples. One matter that may be worthy of consideration is whether, even apart from the question of Aboriginal law and custom, the construction of child, where it appears in the Succession Act, as confirmed in Eats and Gundy, reflects a social conservatism, for want of a better word, which uh, lacks contemporary relevance. The notion that the term child means prima facie a legitimate, that is, born in wedlock, biological child, seems to stem from observations made by Lord Cairns in 1873. In another case, a broader construction of the word child or children, which would include stepchildren, was rejected on the basis that the word was not used in a similar statutory context, quote, as a popular, loose and flexible expression and should be given its accepted meaning, sons and daughters, children of the blood or natural children. But that begs the question, accepted by whom and in what sociological context? Is it popular, loose and flexible to take account of the many different circumstances in which families are created in contemporary times? Or is it appropriate and adapted? What about surrogacy or IVF utilising donor eggs or sperm? Legislation has been passed to address those developments in the composition of our society, but does that mean it is necessarily required in order to expand the meaning of child more broadly? A similar point was made by Justice Kirby, then of the Court of Appeal in New South Wales in Harris and Ashdown, when he uh, observed that attitudes to personal relationships and the provisions of the law on matters such as illegitimacy and adoption have changed so significantly in the past hundred years that it is no longer safe to adopt, even as a rule of thumb, the principle that by the use of the word child in his will, a testator must be taken to mean only a legitimate child. A similar analogy may be drawn from the principle that where ordinary English words are used, current usage is relevant to the task of interpretation. An example of the application of this principle is the decision of the High Court in Bryn and Perpetual Trustee Co Limited, which is discussed in the written paper. But in the course of their reasons in that decision, the court referred to the words of Viscount uh, Simon, uh, Lord Chancellor in Perrin and Morgan, where it was said, the duty of a judge who is called on to interpret a will containing ordinary English words is not to regard previous decisions as constituting a sort of legal dictionary to be con consulted and remorselessly applied. So one might respectfully ask the rhetorical question, is that what was done in Eats and Gundy? Were the previous decisions on the meaning of child ap applied as though they constituted a sort of legal dictionary? Of course, the question of the proper construction of a word or phrase used in a statute is different to the task which is involved in, a, in construing a will. The task when construing a statute is to ascertain the intended meaning of the words used, a process which must be undertaken having regard to the context 
for the provision, including its purpose. But in this regard, the intended meaning is not the subjective in, uh, purpose or actual intention of the legislature, but rather the objective purpose or intention, as it may be revealed by the text which has been used in the context of the whole Act and the broader context. Plainly, the drafters of the Succession Act 1981 did not contemplate issue or child, potentially including a descendant or child not related by blood or legal adoption under the relevant statute law, but rather being recognised as having that relationship by virtue of the operation of traditional laws and customs. But that does not of itself mean that the words cannot be construed to include such a relationship. Questions of public policy, contemporary societal attitudes and modern usage are all relevant, as is the statutory direction contained in section 48, uh, requiring the statutory provision to the extent possible consistent with its purpose to be interpreted in a way that is compatible with human rights. In that sense, the Human Rights Act now forms part of the context in which a statute is to be construed. So could a different conclusion have been reached had Eats and Gundy been decided after the enactment of the Human Rights Act? Historically, the purpose of the English intestacy rules was to protect the interests of the family property. Those provisions were likened to the will the law would expect a member of an average family to make if he or she got around to it. Family provision legislation was enacted to subject, subject freedom of testamentary disposition to discretionary curial intervention in certain cases where moral rights and obligations were disregarded. The focus of the provisions was the family, described as the social and legal institution which, within which these rights and obligations are worked out. It is perhaps difficult to see how it could be said that a broader approach to the meaning of child or issue, including my reference to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander custom, could be inconsistent with those purposes. In addition, if public policy supported recognition of a child born in wedlock as the husband's issue, even if the husband was not the child's father, one might think it is not too difficult to imagine public policy considerations supporting recognition of a parent-child relationship established as a matter of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander custom, particularly in light of the Human Rights Act provisions. I do not express a view about the ultimate answer to this question. It is a difficult one which would benefit from careful consideration and submissions if it were to be argued before a court. I wish to do no more than provoke the thought. Is this an area of the law where the statutory invocation to expressly consider human rights in the interpretation of a statute could result in a change to the law? These issues could, of course, be addressed if the person makes a will, but that is not a straightforward fix uh, because uh, the the taboo nature of subjects of death and dying among many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, have led to low will-making rates. Professor Prue Vines um, has undertaken extensive research uh, and publication in relation to this issue. She advocates for increased will-making for Aboriginal people and provides helpful assistance in relation to drafting culturally appropriate and effective wills. Her work has culminated in the publication of a very useful book called Aboriginal Wills Handbook, now in its third edition. Professor Vines raises some interesting practical suggestions in her work uh, in relation to making culturally appropriate wills, including the need for care to be taken when using words to indicate kinship, because whilst the common law's view of kinship might be limited by blood and a linear view of time, that may not be reflected in an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person's conception of kin kinship, where uh, relationships of mother or cousin or auntie may include a lot more people. She therefore suggests naming specific people so that the real intention of the person is captured. Secondly, she emphasises the need to be aware of the mix of property and obligations owned and or held by an Indigenous person and for care to be taken as to how these things are dealt with. Um, thirdly, she uh, suggests the use of principles of equity 
to consider how to deal with obligations as opposed to property as a commodity in a will, giving some examples by reference to artwork based on ritual knowledge, which I'll come back to shortly. And fourthly, she emphasises the benefits of including a direction about dealing with the body of the deceased person in a will, in attempt to, event, to prevent arguments arising subsequently, a matter I'll also come to shortly. But until there is a higher rate of will making, the solution needs to be found elsewhere. I am not sure that statutory construction is an adequate answer in itself, even having regard to the Human Rights Act. As was emphasised in the High Court's decision in Momsilovich and the Queen, uh, by reference to the Victorian equivalent of Section 48, the task called for by the provision is one of interpretation, within the rubric of the established principles of statutory construction, not judicial rewriting of legislation. The construction question is by no means straightforward and would involve complex and therefore costly litigation. A more straightforward solution would be legislative amendment. There are some uh, examples from the Northern Territory, the New South Wales and Tasmania that may provide a useful guide. This is a matter worthy of serious consideration by government because of the real potential for discrimination and legal disadvantage for traditionally adopted people. The opportunity for that is ripe given that there is a review of the Succession Act underway at present. Uh, a cons consultation paper released by the Attorney General in September 2023 observes that Queensland succession laws are in need of review and modernisation to ensure they give effect to modern societal expectations uh, and has sought the community's views. The paper notes that in the context of in the intestacy rules, consideration is being given to allowing the definition of child of a deceased person to be expanded by court order to include a person who may be such a child uh, under a cultural tradition, and likewise to amending the definition of spouse. The paper acknowledges the cost implications of all of these options, involving as they would uh, an application to the court. And similar changes are under consideration to the meaning of child and spouse uh, in relation to those persons eligible for family provision. Responses to that paper were sought by the 16th of October this year, so it will be interesting to see what comes next. Of course, in any event, it would be necessary for there to be proof of the law and custom and its application in the particular case. In some circumstances, that may be relatively straightforward. For example, if there is, has been a native title determinate determination application, there will have been expert anthropological evidence and evidence from the claimants themselves as to their laws and customs. Um, in other cases, it may be anything but straightforward, as has been the case in some of the matters involving burial disputes. But matters of proof in any particular case ought not stifle the development of the law in a manner which reflects contemporary societal expectations, including by reference to the Human Rights Act. Now, in contrast, uh, one area in which customary law and cultural considerations have been recognised, respected and applied even before the Human Rights Act is in the case of burial disputes. It's well established that the Supreme Court has a, res a role in resolving these uh, kinds of disputes as an incident of its inherent power to grant declaratory relief. Sometimes section six, subsection one of the Succession Act has been identified as the source of the court's jurisdiction to determine burial disputes. That, of course, is the provision which confers jurisdiction on the Supreme Court to hear and determine all testamentary matters and to hear and determine all matters relating to the estate and the administration of the estate of any deceased person. However, as Justice Henry pointed out in Akum and Pickering, there is nothing in Section 6 or in any other provision of the Succession Act, which provides for decision-making as to burial. His Honour explained that the relevance of Section 6 is uh, its conferral of powers to grant letters of administration. And it's relevant in that way because at common law, the usual rule or common starting point is that the person entitled to administration is usually the person responsible for arranging the funeral and burial. Justice Henry in that same case uh, noted that it was uncontroversial in Queensland even 
before the Human Rights Act was enacted that Aboriginal custom, including culture and spiritual beliefs, were relevant considerations in such cases. For that reason, those are not cases in which the enactment of the Human Rights Act is likely to produce a different result. So the starting point, um, as a matter of the, the, the common law or usual rule, as I've said, is that the person entitled to administration of the estate of a deceased person is usually the person responsible for arranging the funeral or burial of the deceased. But it's emphasised in the cases, notably a decision of Chief Justice Doyle in Jones and Dodd, that that usual rule is not a hard and fast rule uh, or principle to be applied rigidly. Um, especially where the person has died intestate without any significant assets, such that there's unlikely to ever be an application for administration, it has been observed that this approach takes on an air of unreality. And the generally accepted approach is that uh, one ought to have regard to the practical circumstances, um, the sensitivity of the feelings of the various relatives and others who might have a claim to bury the deceased, and also religious, cultural or spiritual matters. That has been confirmed in a recent uh, Court of Appeal decision in Western Australia of Brit and the Office of State Coroner. The need for a flexible application of the common law rules was recently emphasised in relation to another category of persons recognised um, as having a right to bury a body where there is no executor or administrator uh, appointed, no will and no estate, namely the parents of the deceased. Purantata Mary and Baird is a 2020 decision of the Court of Appeal of the Northern Territory in relation to a tragic case of a dispute about possession of the body of a 15-year-old boy for burial. At first instance, there were competing applications by the boy's biological mother on the one hand and by her sister um, who had cared for and brought the boy up as his sole caregiver from the time he was five years old on the other. The sister assumed the role of mother and treated the boy as her son for the whole of his life. At first instance, the court ordered that the boy's body be delivered into her possession to arrange the funeral and burial. On the appeal, there was an argument that the court at first instance had erred by not applying a supposed common law rule that it is only blood parents who have the duty and right to bury their dead children. A rule said to have been affirmed in the New South Wales decision of Warner and Levitt. But the Court of Appeal rejected the notion that there was any rigid rule to this effect. And even taking that rule uh, as a starting point, the Court of Appeal also rejected the notion that the rule was confined strictly to biological parents rather than other persons in loco parentis, including foster parents, demonstrating a more flexible approach, one might think, than was taken to the meaning of child in the decision of Eats and Gundy. The Court of Appeal in Purantata Mary contrasted that narrow approach taken in Warner and Levitt, which was acknowledged to be founded on uh, religious beliefs, which not very many people would today hold, and upon social conditions which have changed quite dramatically with the approach taken in another case of Smith and Tamworth City Council by Justice Young, who observed that equity acts as a, course of, as a court of conscience and the conscience is what is right in the eyes of the community for the time being. And what that is, uh, his honour also said, is judged by modern community standards. Another recent example in which Aboriginal cultural considerations were weighed in the balance in deciding a dispute about burial is State of South Australia and Ken. In that case, there was evidence of academic research and writing on Pitanjara burial practices. Uh, Justice Stanley made a finding by reference to that evidence that the primary cultural connection for Anangu men, such as the deceased, was the relationship to their father's and grandfather's country. Balancing the common law principles and practical considerations, as well as paying attention to cultural, spiritual and religious factors, his honour found the burial place proposed by the deceased's father and paternal family should be preferred over the wishes expressed by the deceased's mother. That was not a matter of giving greater weight to the wishes and sensitivities of one side of the family over the other. 
Instead, it was a decision uh, taken having weighed the Aboriginal cultural matters and concerns established by the evidence. In this context, it can be seen that our received legal system has managed to weigh in the balance and give effect to cultural considerations without principled difficulty, albeit the problem of proof and conflict of views about those considerations remains. Modern community standards and questions of the conscience of what is right in the eyes of the community have been accepted as relevant to the understanding and application of common law and equitable rules and principles. When coupled with the statutory instruction provided by section 28 and 48 of the Human Rights Act, these cases could be said to provide an example of how this might also be replicated in other areas of the law. Moving on from deceased estates and burials, another interesting area in which the challenge of the interaction between customary laws uh, and the Australian legal system has arisen is in the context of protection of cultural knowledge embodied in artistic works. As will be seen, equity has come to the rescue when other legal principles have been found to be inadequate or incapable of adaptation. An early case in which cultural considerations arose is Yumbalul and the Reserve Bank of Australia, a 1991 decision of Justice French, then of the Federal Court. This case concerned a dispute about the design of the $10 bank note, released in 1988 to commemorate the first European settlement of this country. The note incorporated elements of Aboriginal artworks, including, in part, a reproduction of the design of a morning star pole made by Mr Yumbalul. The reproduction was made under a sub-licence of the copyright in the work granted to the Reserve Bank by the Aboriginal Artists Agency Limited. That company had an exclusive licence from Mr Yumbalul. The case concerned a claim by Mr Yumbalul that he had been induced to sign the licence by misleading or deceptive conduct on the part of the agency. The Yumbalul case explains the special circumstances in which an Aboriginal artist may be authorised in terms of the laws and customs acknowledged and observed by the person to paint certain designs, including as a result of various levels of initiation or revel revelatory ceremonies in which he has gradually learnt the designs and their meanings. That is a unique situation, quite different from, although also captured within, the broader concept of an individual's moral or inter intellectual rights in a work of art created by them. Having signed the licence agreement, Mr Yumbalal subsequently came under considerable criticism from within his community for permitting the reproduction of the poll by the bank. Although Justice French found that his causes of action against the agency were not established because there had been no misleading or deceptive conduct, His Honour did observe that the case showed it may be that greater care ought to have been taken to ensure that Mr Yumbalul appreciated the, the cultural um, implications of what he was being asked to do. And it was also noted that it may be that Australia's copyright law does not provide adequate recognition of Aboriginal community claims to regulate the reproduction and use of works which are essentially communal in origin. It remains the case that copyright laws do not address these challenges. However, equitable principles have been called in aid to protect cultural knowledge and communal ownership. Another example is Milpururu and Indifern PTYLTD, a case in which a number of Aboriginal artists and the public trustee on behalf of the estates of other artists successfully sued a carpet importer for remedies for copyright infringement in circumstances where the imported carpets had been manufactured by uh, incorporating reproductions of the whole or substantial parts of their artworks without permission. One of the artists gave evidence that, quote, as an artist, while I may own the copyright in a particular artwork under Western law, under Aboriginal law, I must not use an image or story in such a way as to undermine the rights of all the other Yolnu who have an interest, whether direct or indirect in it. In this way, I hold the image on trust for all other Yolnu with an interest in the story. The reproduction of the artworks in circumstances where, for example, in one case, the dreaming depicted would be walked on was totally opposed to the accepted cultural use of the imagery. 
it was accepted that the infringements caused not only personal distress to the claimants, but also that it exposed the artists to embarrassment and contempt within their communities. And the court took into account the effect of the unauthorised reproduction of artistic works um, under customary laws in quantifying the damage suffered. A subsequent case, Bullen Bullen and r and Textiles, involved claims first by Mr Bullen Bullen, who was the create creator of an artistic work for remedies for infringement of his copyright, but also a claim by Mr Milpururu on his own behalf and in a representative capacity for the Ganobingu people in respect of what was uh, claimed to, to be equitable ownership by that broader community in the, uh, in the copyright in the artistic work. Uh, the artistic work, the subject of this case, um, was said to incorporate within its subject matter much that is sacred and important to the Ganalbingu people about their heritage. The respondent had imported and sold in Australia printed clothing fabric, which infringed Mr Bullen Bullen's copyright in the particular work. The claim by Mr Bullen Bullen was resolved by declarations and orders made by consent, uh, including uh, permanent injunctions against future infringement, and the trial proceeded only in respect of the broader claim by Mr Milpururu. It was once again observed that the statutory remedies under the Copyright Act were inadequate as a means of protecting communal ownership in an artistic work, a point that had been made in those earlier cases. However, the court, Justice Von Dusa, approached the matter from the perspective that Australian courts cannot treat as irrelevant the rights, interests and obligations of Aboriginal people embodied within customary law. And he said that evidence of customary law may be used as a basis for the foundation of rights recognised within the Australian legal system. Following what was described as a wide-ranging search for a way in which the communal interests of the traditional Aboriginal owners in cultural artworks might be recognised under Australian law, the claim by Mr Milpururu was ultimately con confined to one for recognition of an equitable interest in the legal copyright of Mr Bullen Bullen. Although Justice Von Dusa considered the possibility that an express trust had been created, uh, he found the evidence did not support such a conclusion because there was no usual or customary practice where artworks were held on trust for the Ganalbingu people and the fact that Mr Bullen Bullen sold and retained the proceeds for his own use was inconsistent with an intention to create an express trust. However, His Honour did find that Mr Bullen Bullen owed a fiduciary obligation to the Ganalbingu people saying that the relationship between Mr Bullen Bullen as the author and legal title holder of the artistic work and the Ganel Bingu people was unique. The transaction between them, out of which the fiduciary relationship was said to arise, was the use with permission by Mr Bullen Bullen of ritual knowledge of the Ganel Bingu people and the embodiment of that knowledge within the artistic work. That use was permitted in accordance with the laws and customs of the Ganel Bingu people. His Honour uh, said that the, the conclusion that in all the circumstances Mr Bullen Bullen owed fiduciary obligations to the Ganalbingu people did not treat the law and custom of the Ganalbingu people as part of the Australian legal system. Rather, it treats the law and custom uh, of those people as part of the factual matrix which characterises the relationship as one of mutual trust and confidence. And it is that relationship which the Australian legal system recognises as giving rise to the fiduciary relationship and to the obligations which arise out of it. Justice Von Dusa's analysis in that case was referred to with approval uh, in the High Court's decision in Western Australia and Ward. In that case, the High Court held that insofar as claims to protection of cultural knowledge go beyond denial or control of access to land and waters, they are not native title rights. However, it was noted that the law in relation to confidential information, copyright or fiduciary duties may afford some protection for such rights, referring to the case of Bullen Bullen. In the context of protection of cultural knowledge embodied in artistic works, it is hard to see how the lens of the Human Rights Act could alter the view. 
Already, equity has risen to the challenge where the received common law and subsequently enacted statute law may be said to have failed to adequately adapt to recognise and deal with rights and obligations which arise under customary law. What these cases in relation to the disparate topics of burial disputes and artistic works demonstrate, however, is the potential adaptability of the law, which is one of the fundamental equitable principles. Likewise they, they, likewise, they demonstrate the law of equity acting as a court of conscience, that which is right in the eyes of the community for the time being, responding to modern societal expectations and so enabling a quality of enjoyment of rights. They appropriately recognise as relevant the rights, interests and obligations of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people embodied within customary law. Those considerations coupled, coupled with the legislative invocation of the Human Rights Act arguably support an approach to construction of a statute such as the Succession Act in a manner which is compatible with and gives effect to the distinct cultural rights of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people, for example, in relation to kinship ties. And they certainly support serious consideration being given to appropriate legislative reform. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Justice. I know that that excellent presentation required a great deal of thought and effort. It took a lot of time, a sparse commodity for a committed Queensland Chief Justice and parent of teenagers, and you were even able to multi-skill with the PowerPoint in the absence of your associate. So it was um, absolutely a tour de force. I think this is probably the first time uh, this lecture has been delivered with a perspective of, uh, the, of First Nations people. So it was extremely timely and long overdue. Um, I think it was fascinating to uh, hear of the uh, potential of the use of the um, Queensland Human Rights Act in developing um, our jurisprudence here in Queensland. And, uh, and also I think we'll, we'll look with interest at the um, review of the Succession Act and how that is now going to uh, take into account the perspective of um, First Nations peoples. And I think it's a, a great step towards reconciliation that we are now uh, thinking about uh, non-Indigenous law uh, from the perspective of First Nations people. So a really important development that you have shed light on tonight and I'm sure your lecture will be published and will inspire uh, young barristers and, uh, and solicitors present to take on cases and, um, and uh, test some of the ideas that you've floated tonight. So thank you so much for that. Uh, there would, of course, as the Chief Justice has indicated, be no WA Lee equity lecture without Professor Tony Lee, now in his 94th year and, as you've heard, sadly unable to be with his with us this evening. I know he follows this event with enormous interest. You can see he, he did because he insisted on having the first word in the Chief Justice's presentation. And I'm, I know that he will be uh, watching the video that is, is taken of tonight's lecture. Uh, I have to um, thank Professor Lee for all he's done for the Legal Academy in Queensland and far beyond. My next thank you tonight is uh, to the sponsors of this evening, the T.C. Burns School of Law, University of Queensland, represented tonight by the Dean of Law, Professor Rick uh, Bigwood, and Queensland Community Foundation, whose Board of Governors I have the honour to chair. Uh, thank you, Professor Bigwood, for sp sponsoring this important lecture series, which is always an intellectual legal triumph, as it was absolutely tonight. Uh, Queensland Community Foundation, the state's largest public charitable trust, is changing its name later this month to Queensland Gives. We believe this will better reflect what we do and why and how we do it. We know we must be on the right track as the National Organisation Philanthropy Australia is soon to follow suit with a name change to Australia Gives. To imitate is to flatter. It's fitting that Queensland Community Foundation, Queensland Gives, sponsors this annual equity lecture. The concept of equity in its broadest sense 
encompasses a notion of social inclusion and fairness. And we've seen that tonight in the way that this lecture uh, is now looking at uh, the perspective of First Nations people. Um, with a corpus of around $124 million and growing, QCF is committed to a socially inclusive Queensland now and forever. This year, Queensland gives, through its 225 sub-funds set up by both legacies and living donors and its general fund, will distribute a record of over $5 million to Queensland charities, enabling Queensland community organisations to work even more effectively uh, right up into the Cape and, uh, and beyond. We encourage a give where you live philosophy through our regional sub-funds and regional committees, the Northern Queensland, Toowoomba and Gold and Sunshine Coasts. Queensland Gives also celebrates and encourages Queensland philanthropy generally, not just those who donate to us, with our prestigious annual philanthropy awards and our philanthropy in focus photographic challenge. This year was touched with a note of sadness for Queensland Gives, with the passing of our patron and principal founder, the Honourable Micah Hearn AO, a great Queenslander. I warmly acknowledge his daughter Claire, who is here tonight. Uniquely, Queensland Gives generous sponsorship from founding sponsors, QIC and Anglo Coal, means that every tax deductible dollar donated to QCF goes straight to its capital fund providing a perpetual income stream for charitable purposes right throughout this vast state. This sponsorship makes Queensland Gives the ideal ve vehicle for you or your clients to become philanthropists with the gift that keeps on giving through either a tax deductible donation from as little as $2 to our general fund or by establishing your own named charitable sub fund, whether by legacy or as a living donor, all without expensive setup costs or ongoing worries. One of our sub-funds of particular interest to this audience is probably the Law Rights Civil Justice Fund. Please contact the amazing Queensland Gives team to learn more about how you or your clients can be part of the Queensland Gives enduring legacy. Our name is changing, but contact details remain the same. Follow us on social media to keep abreast of our name change on the 15th of November and our 2024 Philanthropy Awards, which will include a conversation with a much-loved sporting philanthropist, Queensland's own Ash Barty. As you leave this magnificent ceremonial courtroom this evening to join us for refreshments, generously sponsored by De Groot's Wills and Estate Lawyers, Mitchell's Solicitors and Estate First Lawyers, please purchase, at, uh, if you can, a ticket, a raffle ticket from our team in the foyer to win the fabulous $4,000 Haspali Pearl gift voucher a perfect Christmas present for you or someone you love. And finally, thank you all for making the time in your busy lives to join us this evening. Thank you.